Can I just have a quick show of hands? How many people here would say that changing minds was a part of your job? That's quite a lot, okay. How many would say it's a really important part of your job? That's, that's still a lot, okay. Uh, because it is, most jobs are like this. And I, I, I'm going to start off with a story. Um, years ago, go back to 1988 for those who can, um, I was Dilbert. I had a cubicle, and I sat in my cubi cubicle all day, quite happy, in a farm of other cubes. I was uh, coding, I was uh, at the time writing a word processor system for Hewlett Packard. And I was reasonably happy getting on with things. Then one day, a manager came by and said, Hey Dave, how would you like to go and work for the quality department? And I thought, hey, that sounds interesting. That means I'll get out, I'll get to see other people, I'm curious about the big picture and so on. So, so I said, yeah, okay. And uh, my first job was to set up some coding standards. So I went around, did the kind of bright thing, I spoke to everybody, I, I looked at the internet of the day, comp.lang.c, anybody remember that one? Long time ago, but anyway, um, that was a Usenet before uh, Mosaic. So um, anyway, we came up with the standards, 44 pages, I was a good engineer, could make them nice and, and long. And uh, I, I sent out a message, and here's the email, an email from 1988. Uh, and I said, okay, guys, here we go, here's the coding standards, I've spoken to you all, this is great, this is a committee of people, and, and so on. And uh, guess what they said? They said, that's great, they're great coding standards, well done. However, I'm different. And they don't, they don't work for me. So I'm going to be doing my own thing. I hope you, but, but well done. And I thought, oh dear, and this light bulb went on over my head. And I thought, oh, this quality stuff's easy. It's the people stuff that's difficult. And I don't know too much about that. So I better do something about it and, and, and learn some more. Um, the, the coding standards, by the way, weren't adopted, but they were useful because I turned them into a book. Prentice Hall's sold them and we held, sold a whole bunch and I got interested in writing, so, which is why I'm here today, so nothing is wasted. So, this changing minds thing, what is it? I didn't know, I was like, is, is it this stuff like these stage hypnotists, you know, they, you sort of look at people and, you know, they, they, you know they're, they're impaled by your gaze. And, and I seem to be wrong, it, surely it's not like that. Um, what about this? Is it just about pulling strings, behaviorism and so on? Well, I knew some people who did this, or sort of seemed to do it, and it still didn't seem right. There was something wrong, so I need to kind of get better. Um, my, my approach at the time, you know, we, there's a thing called HP Gallery, it was before PowerPoint. But I've taken up PowerPoint since. My name is David, I am a PowerPoint addict. This morning, everybody else was at breakfast, I was playing my slides. I don't know how many hours I spent on it, but I don't know how persuasive they are either. So, I decided to chew into it. I need to do this. Be a proper good engineer. What do you do if you're an engineer? You dig. You get out your shovel, you dig. You get to rock bottom, you keep digging. So, um, I started reading stuff. Uh, and I went on every course I could and um, tried to find out this. How do, how do people work? How do I teach stuff and so on? I left the... Um, the, the division that was writing software, I went to work for the sales and marketing organization. I did quality work there as well, and guess what? Salespeople don't like being told what to do either. But there we go. And eventually, keep on digging, where do you get to? You get into psychology. So I went into that, and Durgan, I even started reading journals. And I started liking reading journals. So I must apologize. Um, one of the useful models that, that came up around then, it was um, this idea of the elephant and the rider. Uh, and this is about the mind. The, you know, the, the, your conscious mind is this bit on top. You know, this is the bit, this is the you that does the thinking, the you that's sitting here now. This is me, I'm the rider. But underneath, we sit on top of this elephant. And the problem is, the elephant is unconscious, it's the irrational bit. And when you want to persuade, you've got to persuade the elephant, not just the rider. You know, you, the PowerPoint might persuade the rider, but the elephant, that needs something else. So how do we decide? 
Do we decide with our brains? Yes, to some extent. However, you know, the emotional side is important. It, it, it's there, and often the last point at which you say yes to a decision, that's often got a significant emotional component. Um, and we really do feel feelings. This is a bit of research, you may have seen this, in which there's an investigation of where you feel in your body, where you feel emotions. So things like happiness, you feel it all over. You know, it, you, 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 there's a big buzz all over, you tingle. Whereas something like depression, you go numb. We feel feelings. Emotions are felt in the body. You know, there's a mental component, but there's a significant physical component. So, all this reading and stuff brought me down to, and this is kind of like the slide, you can get up and go after this one, um, is this pattern, I would say, read around all kinds of different disciplines, saying what's the core thing that happens in there. So the center of that, we're going to spend more time on that today, is tension. You feel tension, yeah, and persuasion is around tension. So things like desire is tension, fear is tension, yeah, emotions are tension. And if you can understand tensions, you can do a lot in changing minds. We'll talk about more in a minute, because there's more here. Ten after tension is closure. Closure is the point at of resolution of tension. It is, for example, where you're learning something. You get the tension of not knowing and the aha of knowing. That's the closure. It's when the salespeople build a crank up the tension when they're selling to you and the point at which you decide to buy, that's closure. Sometimes it's when you've got change management going on and you're kind of like receiving it, the point at which you know, there's tension of, oh my goodness, there's a change, and you accept, oh well, we're going to have to go along with it. That's closure. At the other side is trust. As Powell was talking about earlier, trust is critical, it's really important, and there's an awful lot in there. Trust is the gateway to persuasion, and this is why you just can't persuade anybody, you've got to have trust. And if you're going to be working with the people, you can't just use sort of short-term, sort of similarity type things, you've got to get into the detail. You know, you've got to be reliable, you've got to be honest, and you've got to show that you care. Think about the people that you trust, and what is about them. You've got, to be, you've got to gain that trust. And trust is, is not easily given, it's lost in a moment. Beyond this, then, is commitment at the other end. Closure is agreement, commitment leads to action. If you haven't got commitment, you won't get action. You might have got agreement. <coughs> and the only non-feeling thing, really, is, emotion, is, is, is information. Information is power. It happens you know, all the time and you should know as much as you can about the other person, what they want, what drives them and so on. Yourself, your own feelings, where you are about it. And it's an ongoing process of managing and acquiring and using information. So tension, let's look at that. They're going to dig into tension more now. So tension is about these gaps between things. It's about you know, what you want, what I don't want, and so on. And if you can understand a person and their tension, you can understand their gaps in their lives, whether it's work gaps, home laps, and gaps, and so on. Because tension is a, is a scalar quantity, it's a physical quantity, it's an amount, and it's the sum of all the gaps in life. And that's the tension you feel at the moment in its amount. And the ten tension, the scalar quantities, they include intensity of tension, it includes duration, the pattern includes whether it's positive or negative. Scalar is, uh, sorry, uh, tension is also a vector. It has direction. And just like in math mathematics, you resolve all the vectors in a diagram and they'll push people in one direction. The direction people go is a resolution of the various tensions in their life. So you need to work with these. You might have seen this one. This is the yerkes dodson curve where you crank up the tension, performance goes up, and then too much goes down. The first bit is a bit of boredom. If you, you know, we need tension in our lives. It's not a bad thing. We need it. If we haven't got enough, we're bored. We go out, we look for excitement, interest, something to do. There's a bit in the middle, which is about flow, which is where you're getting well into it, you're enjoying it. 
And at the other end is overlap, sorry, ov overload. When we're in overload, this is where we talk about stress. This is, you know, this is, this is where we go relief-seeking. We'll do anything just to get the tension off us. And this is where dysfunction can happen because we're now not trying to meet our goals. We're just trying to get the tension off. And all sorts of bad things can happen there, including it can, it can kill you, literally. So in managing tension, you can crank up the current tensions that people already have. You know, about work, you can just wind those up or whatever. You can add new tensions, but all these things tend to put people into overload because we tend to work at our level com comfort level already. So what we need to do is to, before we start raising tensions, is find the tensions to reduce. Yeah, and that includes things that will build trust as well. So there's other benefits to it. You know, if this is my level of tension, if people try to push me up, I'll go into overload and I'll just push back, go into fight or flight. So let's look at some of the models out there of persuasion. These are some of the classic models. You may well have seen a number of these and where this all fits together. Robert Cialdini wrote an excellent book called Influence. If, if you've not read it, I can well recommend it. It's very readable, very nice, very good book. First thing he talks about is reciprocity. There's a social rule that says, if I do something for you, you've got to do something back for me. And you will feel the tension of that. You know, you, you know you're obliged to people. Obligation is about tension. So that's used a lot in, in persuasion. Consistency. This is between the things we do and our values and beliefs. So we work in a company that's forcing us to do things we don't like. That's tension. This is actually used deliberately in brainwashing where you get people to do little things and the idea is that their beliefs change, catch, change themselves to catch up with the things they're actually doing, doing stepwise at a time. Social proof is a really big deal um, because we're social people, we care about what other people think, even people we don't know. So, and what in particular, if we're not sure what to do, you know, somebody falls over in the street or somebody, we come around, there's somebody lying there, what shall I do? We look around to other people. What other people do is really important to us for deciding what we do, because we want to fit in. Authority, we're trained to obey authority. Somebody gives a command, we will um, obey. If anybody knows of Milgram experiments, where peop people were asked to electrocute other people, even to the point of death, so an enormous number of people did. Liking, we do things for people we like, we're friends, yeah? So, you know, this is why salespeople are nice, guess what? And scarcity, when you go to the, you know, there's a sale on, when there's only a few left, we feel that tension. Here's an example. Um, when I was going to come here, I was looking up uh, hotels to stay at near the airport in Britain. And look at the stuff in here. My God, it's just absolutely packed with it. Yeah, this is all designed to build your tension. Look at this. Domestic traveler's choice. Um, high demand, social proof. Yeah? How many times in the last 24 hours? Here is a data, which is authority. Value deal. Um, repeated. And it's also reducing tensions. See, very clean. That's about reducing your worries about it not being clean. Green things, see they use color. You know, red to speed you up, you know, green to make you feel good. Yeah, free cancellation, reducing tensions. It's all in there. It's no wonder, and this is all done, you know, with, through all this, you know, lots of research and so on. Every single word is picked. Spin selling, another method. This is some, a method that was used a lot in HP. Um, this is, and, and this is also very usable as a, as a practical method. First thing you do is situation questions. You ask the person um, about the situation. Just learn things. This is information gathering. Okay, how's the company doing? You know, what's, what's been happening in your life? Da da da. And that gives you information. You're then going to narrow in with the P as the problem questions. You're then looking, asking questions, looking for a problem that you can solve. But still information. But once you know, ah, they've got this problem which I can solve, now I can do something about it. Because the next level is the tension question. 
the implication. This is saying, well, what happens if? You know, what are the bad things and so on? Insurance companies love this, but it's used a lot all the time anyway. And then need payoff questions, so it's SPIN, spin. Need payoff, called saying, well, how could we resolve this? And a good salesperson will build attention so much in the implications. When they ask you, say, what could we do? They will just need to hold out the product in their hand, you'll bite the hands off. If there's any objection handling they do, they don't, shouldn't need to do it because they've managed the question so well, built the tension correctly. A major pattern that happens here is hurt and rescue. This is appears all the time. Hurt is tension building, rescue is closure. Hurt can also be build desire because where desire is hurt as well. I really, really want that camera, you know? And closure is bought it. Wow, I've got the new camera. Uh, the last method uh, described here is called principled negotiation. This was developed um, in the early 80s when the Americans and Russians, Russians were negotiating the SALT strategic arms limitation uh, by reducing nuclear weapons. And they went to Harvard Business Review, sorry, Harvard School, uh, Business School, and said, how can we negotiate with the Russians? And they came up with this, and it was very successful. Key thing about it, it's collaborative negotiation. It is not competitive negotiation. Uh, and it's written in a book called uh, Getting to Yes, which is an excellent book, and there's a whole series of books uh, after that by the same authors, Fisher and Urey, uh, which I very much recommend. Again, very practical in a business setting. So the first step, what do you do? Go to the balcony. Step back rather than react. Step back. Look at what's happening. Try and understand the person. Look at yourself as well and what's happening there. Next step, step to their side. See things from their viewpoint. Empathy, yeah? As Mel and Crystal were talking about before. Then you start building the tension. First of all, you make it easy to say yes. And then you, if they don't say, uh, go along with you, you make it harder to say no. Build up the tension. And finally, you get to deploy your BATNA. And the BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And uh, that's just building tension again. What's my walk away? What's my Brexit walk away? Don't get me onto Brexit, please. I'll be here all day. So, where do we see this? Online, clickbait. Have you noticed clickbait, how it makes you feel? It is designed to build tension in you. So think of these things here, the 29. Why 29? Because it stands out, it's authoritative. Sounds like you've done your research. You know, make you laugh, authority. I promise, building trust. You know, another one from Upworthy, um, depressing Hogwarts letter, something that's going to attract attention. You should read it, authority. Um, this one, weird old tip. This has been around for quite a while, but it's de designed and it's deliberately intended to play on, you know, body image and so on. Um, I certainly don't endorse it, but it's used. This is just a typical one that, that happens all the time. This one was from a National Daily Newspaper's website. It looks like news and it just goes underneath, but it's full of clickbait. It's, uh, this is an article here from uh, Engadget, linking clickbait to fake news, because fake news uses clickbait, and it's about the power of feeling. Guess what? It's how you make people feel. That's what changes them. This is from the Institute from the Future, and there's a whole bunch of stuff here, which is kind of pretty scary, really. You know, come the singularity, maybe before that machines will get empathy. You will prefer to talk to this machine because it understands you. And it's a nicer conversation than with other people. These things are coming. This is, only f this is from 2010. This is not new. And I don't know if anybody in this room is working on this. I suspect it's possible. And this is a, uh, a Guardian article from this uh, weekend. 
Justin Rosenstein. He's the click, uh, the, sorry, the guy from Facebook who invented the like button. Yeah, and such a little thing, such an enormously powerful effect. And he's now saying, this is really bad. He, he has set up parental controls on his own system in order to stop himself, because he says, I am addicted to this, I can't stop myself. And he's the guy who put a lot of it in. So overall then, changing minds, it's a bit like photography. I'm, I'm a keen photographer, this is, this is Berlin. And that anybody can press the button. We all change minds, we all do it all the time. But like photography, you can get better at it. You know, you study it, you practice it, you, be atten you know, pay attention to it. And gradually you get better at it, which means you get more effective. Because if you do it badly, we, when we try to change minds and we're not good at it, it's like using a sledgehammer. We just do damage. You can hurt people when you should, you know, they should, you know, work with you. So, if you don't want to take up photography, I would recommend taking up learning more about changing minds. So, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any example in your life that you would be glad to share with us a success of convincing someone to something you, you wanted to convince him to? I was working, with, I, I had a new manager and um, she was a bit worried because I was older than her and I wanted to be able to work with her. So I just you know, sat down with her and said, my job is to make you successful. Yeah? Because she had a tension about me maybe what being worried because I was older or how I behave. And then I'd do little things. I'd make, you know, give her some slides. She was going to go and do a presentation somewhere. I you know, talked about things. I would try it hard to make her job successful. I reduced her tension. That let me make suggestions and so on. And so she'd listen to me when, before she might not have. Thank you.